Uh, um, I can wave it at you. I'm sorry that uh, we can't be here in person and be trying to sell you lots of coppers, but uh, um, hopefully you will have either read it or be able to buy it. Um, so um, I'll explain briefly about how we came to write the book and its purpose. And first of all, as is a PEF book, I should uh, say a few words about PEF, the Progressive Economy Forum. Uh, so the forum was founded in 2018 and it has a council of eminent economists and academics, now about 22 members. The forum was created as a result of frustration felt by me and many who joined the council at the harmful direction of economic policy in the UK, particularly since 2010. And that direction hadn't been properly tackled by opposition parties and perhaps indeed by many economists. And we were fed up with the myths and lies peddled about economics by the government and the right wing media, which have had a huge uh, influence on public opinion. For example, that the national budget is just like a household budget, uh, that public debt and deficits are harmful, that there's no magic money tree. So we wanted to bring together the best progressive e economists and with them help political parties acquire credible policies. That would in turn help the next progressive government into power and then the policies would be implemented. Sounds simple enough, that was the plan. Um, so for three years, uh, we produced blogs and papers and public lectures. We worked with Labour and John McDonnell in particular and had some success in changing opinion about austerity. And then COVID came around and so to the book. Uh, in March 2020, the country entered the first lockdown and the government was forced to uh, shut down whole areas of the economy to reduce the spread of COVID and prevent the NHS from being overwhelmed. Uh, so the government had to spend and borrow unprecedented sums to keep businesses afloat, preserve jobs and pay for healthcare and vaccines. Suddenly, the ground seemed to be fertile for new ideas of big state action. Myths were being busted before our eyes. So we decided to compile a book of essays to tackle the challenge, not just of COVID, also Brexit, the consequences of austerity and climate change and all at once. So it was to be a kind of PEF manifesto, reversing years of the wrong policies and harnessing the power of the state to produce a more stable and equitable economy. And we found a publisher, the excellent uh, Agenda Publishing, and in June 2020, uh, we signed the contract and in October, we handed over the manuscript and in February 2021, it went to print. Uh, unfortunately, due to COVID, we still haven't managed the public launch. Uh, I should say that the book is dedicated to our PEF council member, John Weeks, former professor at SOAS. He helped us set PEF up uh, and he was one of the editors of the book and tragically he died in July 2020, just as the book was underway. Um, Jan Toporowski stepped into John's shoes and became a co-editor with me and Sue Consulman. And it was a struggle to edit and complete this manuscript in such a short time frame. But Sue and Jan were brilliant in all aspects of editing as well as writing their own chapters. Uh, and I thank all our authors who produced their chapters with great speed and efficiency in the summer of 2020. Actually, they couldn't go on holiday at that time due to COVID, so we gave them something useful to do over the holidays, the holiday period. So um, in our analysis, we call time on the 43-year neoliberal experiment, which has guided policy since 1979 with the intention of shrinking the state. Um, the reduction of taxes on the wealthy and the sale of state assets and deregulation did not lead to an explosion of enterprise and growth. Instead, it has caused instability, a great increase in inequality, the enrichment of a few at the top and the impoverishment of millions at the bottom. And it's resulted in a corruption of capitalism, tarnished by cronyism, rent extraction, and the tendency to monopoly. Deregulation, financialization, and reckless banking caused the 2008 crash. The resulting deficit was used as an, uh, an excuse to impose austerity. The effects of this fueled the Brexit vote and Brexit in turn is causing harm to our economy, export businesses, peace in Northern Ireland and the Union with Scotland. All this is the consequence of uh, failed or misguided ideology. And we have to stop making fundamental mistakes in running the economy. But the pandemic 
revealed uh, the best of the state, the NHS COVID treatment of patients, the vaccine programme and the research which led to the vaccine. It also showed up the worst aspects of private enterprise, cronyism in, in contracts, billions spent on track and trace for questionable benefit and fraud on huge scale. So we challenged the whole concept of shrinking the state. Instead, our book is deliberately called The Return of the State. The government can spend billions of pounds when it has a mind to, and the sky does not fall in. Only the state can organize and spend on this scale in a national emergency. And the state plays a vital role in preventing crises from happening. Using its borrowing and spending power, the state can direct investment to all parts of the nation. In fact, failing to do this means resources stay idle, poverty rises, extremist politics flourish, which is what happened in the 1930s and is in danger of happening again. The state could, if it wished, all but elim eliminate poverty. So in our book, we attempt to provide solutions in key areas such as health, care, housing, education, company purpose, debt, pensions, and the in international framework. We call for the reform of benefits and a guaranteed income floor. We look at tax reform, national debt, and a progressive recovery. So there's never been a greater need for bold and innovative solutions for these times. So um, I'll stop there. And we're lucky enough to have six of the authors of chapters with us. Uh, so I'll hand back to you, uh, Nick, to bring in the next speaker. Thank you very much. And first we have Professor Richard Wilkinson to discuss post-pandemic health and well-being. Um, just make sure to unmute yourself, Professor. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, Kate and I are responsible for the third chapter, um, putting equality at the heart of the recovery. Um, and uh, we put forward uh, actually uh, a set of proposals for reducing, mainly for reducing inequality, um, creating a more equal society, um, things to do with enforcing the, um, or bringing into uh, effect the socioeconomic duty uh, that governments have to look at the implications of policy for uh, inequality. Um, <clears throat> uh, the case for progressive income and wealth taxes, UBI, um, and in, of course, increasing living wage, employee representation through, for instance, employee controlled trusts, as uh, Sweden tried, um, which I think um, Will Hutton has more to say about, um, uh, policies to end child poverty and selective education, and uh, also making well being rather than growth the aim of, of policy. Uh, I think all those things are better understood and also better read uh, than dealt with like this. I want to talk really about the psychological effects of inequality, which I'm afraid that have not been grasped widely at all yet. People always think of uh, inequality primarily in material terms. I think everyone's used to our work where we showed a whole range of problems getting worse with uh, greater income inequality. Um, <clears throat> you may be interested to know, just as we said, uh, health was worse in more unequal countries, that there are now, uh, I think, actually six papers showing that uh, COVID um, was much more severe, killing more people in more unequal countries. Um, <clears throat> uh, not just for the reasons that are often cited, but also because of the chronic stress that goes with inequality substantially lowers uh, immunity. So I, I will just take the liberty of using these few minutes to talk a little bit about the effects of inequality, uh, uh, the psychological effects of inequality, which I think are uh, really the pathway through which all the things, all the health and social problems we've shown uh, are related to inequality. Uh, they are the important pathway. Um, <clears throat> 
I think there's a tendency always to think that inequality only matters if it creates poverty or, or is regarded as incredibly unfair. But actually, we have to see it as more like a social relationship, uh, to think of inequality as a social relationship, uh, which creates uh, us in a rank ordered system of superiority and inferiority. It's through that pathway that it does so much uh, damage, uh, increasing violence, worsening um, health and uh, reducing life expectancy, uh, reducing child well-being, increasing prison populations, all the rest of it. Um, basically, what we have to understand is that what inequality does is make the social pyramid more important. It makes class and status more important. And you see this in lots of different ways. Um, <clears throat> all the problems to social, uh, related to social status, as we showed, increase. Residential segregation increases with inequality. You get fewer interclass marriages. You're less likely to marry someone from a different class. Community life weakens, social mobility declines. The whole social structure becomes more ossified. Um, and exerts um, more powerful effects on us. So really, I think with inequality, we're talking about whether we live in a, a, a society with a very steep social pyramid like that or a much shallow one, and that changes the quality of social relationships in all sorts of different ways. When I say that it increases the importance of social status, um, you see that that results in um, uh, increased status anxiety. Along the bottom here, you have uh, the 10 deciles of the income distribution. And uh, you can see the top line in the more unequal, is for more status anxiety in more unequal countries. And status anxiety, that's anxiety about how you're seen and judged by others, higher in all income groups. Uh, than in low in inequality countries, the bottom line there. Uh, and that has multiple effects. First, it's one of the most powerful influences. It's those kinds of things which lead to anxiety more powerfully than other sources uh, of stress. Um, it's that that pushes up um, biological levels of stress hormones. It also increases self-enhancement, um, <clears throat> people bigging themselves up, self-advertisement, self-aggrandizement, all that kind of thing increases in more unequal societies. Um, and we also see um, that it uh, leads to increased uh, status competition, more consumerism, people in more unequal places are more likely to spend money on um, uh, status goods, um, fast cars, expensive uh, designer clothing, and so on. Money becomes more important in these societies, but it also affects um, uh, sexual competition, the competition for sex partners. Women are more likely in more unequal countries to, dis to, to put online sexier selfies. Um, uh, people with more masculinized faces uh, appear to become more attractive. Uh, the big man view of um, the characters who we want. If you're thinking of uh, social hierarchies, it's uh, 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 biases more us more to uh, rank ordered societies uh, and the tough guys at the at the top. The big the the big man. Um, view of leadership. Uh, all this um, leads also to worse mental health. Um, large numbers of papers have been reviewed on mental health and uh, um, personality disorders, showing that so often they are triggered to it by issues to do with subordination, submissiveness, or dominance and uh, superiority. Um, those are common triggers or exacerbating factors uh, in, um, <clears throat> uh, 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 in mental illness. And recently in the 
um, British Medical Journal, uh, there was a paper confirming what we'd said earlier, uh, that mental illnesses are actually more common through those pathways in more unequal societies. Along the bottom here, you've got correlation co coefficients between inequality in different countries and levels of the most common mental disorders. Um, and I think in economics particularly, there is a failure to recognize the ways in which our brains are triggered to behave in ways appropriate to, if you like, monkey dominance ranking systems uh, rather than uh, more egalitarian relationships. Um, <clears throat> so much research has come out on that in the last few years. Um, and I, I, I should perhaps apologize for using this opportunity to, to push that. But I think even on the left, um, there is so much uh, intellectual snobbishness, uh, a tendency to, um, <clears throat> um, to justify inequality, uh, talking about people, as, uh, some people as brilliant and others not, as if we really believed in the um, uh, the genetic view of IQ, which is really now a failed research program. So uh, I'm going to stop there. I'm sorry to take advantage of this, but it is something that the left really has to understand. Thank you. Thanks very much, Professor Wilkinson, for not only um, making us think about economic, about inequality from an economic perspective, but also its psychological perversity. Next, I'd like to welcome Will Hutton to the floor to discuss an ownership revolution. Yes, um, good evening, everybody, and, and thanks again for the opportunity um, to say a few words about um, a subject I've been writing about and thinking about for over 30 years. Uh, it was the heart of my book, The State We're In, which I published 30 years ago. Um, essentially, I mean, I'm, I mean, just to give you a, 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 a beginning point, I mean, I, I, uh, we're very strong. Um, the liberal left has always been very strong on um, um, inequality, uh, uh, its malevolence. It's very strong on the need for kind of public action to underwrite people's social and economic circumstances and deliver high quality public services. But I mean, the left had its origins um, uh, in a, uh, co a contested capitalism as it operated um, in the second half of the 19th and first half of the 20th century. And actually that contestation um, has really fallen away. Um, uh, um, again, I mean, um, there was a kind of brief revival um, uh, um, under Jeremy, Jeremy Corbyn in which kind of uh, the critique of capitalism collapsed into saying kind of effect, let, let's socialize and nationalize as much as we possibly can. Um, and I start with a different, a different kind of proposition. I think, um, uh, the Labour Party, um, the Liberal Left, um, non-Tories to pick up uh, one of our, uh, our introducers opening remarks, uh, have to have um, a critique of capitalism um, at, their, at, its, at the core of um, what we think. Um, and the evidence for that need is all around. I mean, I, uh, um, um, when, I was, when I was at the age of some of the students on this call, um, uh, ISGI was a top chemical company in Europe and, and GEC was a top engineering company in Europe, at least as good as their opposite numbers in Germany, Siemens and Herxt, uh, both don't exist anymore. Uh, and actually that the impact of that collapse um, on kind of incomes, employment, uh, job security, apprenticeship, life chances in the Midlands and the North of England is there for all to see because they're not the only ones. Uh, and as we, as you, as I talk to you, I mean, I am uh, in the water industry, which was privatized um, 30 years ago. You have um, some water companies that are pub publicly owned, um, like Scottish Water, or mutually owned, like Welsh Water, or really committed to public purpose, like Anglia um, and Seven Trent are doing really quite well, and others who are discharging untreated sewage coming into the into the sea and the uh, and rivers um, like Southern Water and to a degree Thames Water, um, whose ownership um, priorities are wholly different from those other companies. And the water industry is quite an interesting kind of case, kind of 
uh, case history or, ca or case in point of Hawaii ownership really, really matters. NVIDIA um, uh, is an American uh, kind of semiconductor company, games company that wanted to take over ARM, which could have been based in Cambridge and one of the jewels of not just British, but European kind of uh, high-tech technology, but the ownership structure owned by lots and lots of institutional shareholders, none of whom were committed to its cause, allowed it to be taken out by uh, this curious um, kind of Japanese bank on private equity house called SoftBank. And I can go on and on and on. Um, retailers, um, we've lost Asda, um, we've lost Morrison's, part of our food supply chain, um, which you all depend on, particularly in, in turbulent times, um, is now run by private equity. Um, some private equity companies um, are okay, but actually in the main, the business model is to um, load the company up with debt and squeeze it very hard and actually uh, kind of um, employ satisfaction, reliability, uh, sustainability uh, are not priorities. The, you know, ownership really matters. Um, and the left were right to say that ownership really matters. Um, it, the owners actually set priorities, set strategies, um, their time horizons, um, their culture, um, the purpose they want to put their assets to are all, are all determined by owners. And it is in kind of the collective interest that that is done um, around considerations wider than just maximizing shareholder value um, kind of in the, in the time period ahead. Um, and actually British capitalism is particularly wide open to this. Um, even American capitalism uh, has stabler owners than, than we do, and what's called block holders in the, in the trade, I, a third or two fifths of the equity of a typical American company is owned by four or five shareholders, maybe the employees, and sometimes the family founder, but people who actually will anchor the company and actually care about it, um, rather uh, like people care about houses or farms or uh, vintage cars, they really care about the company. And um, British owners don't really care or haven't historically cared much about the company, although there are signs of that changing. Um, Germany, the same story. I mean, you can't find a capitalism where ownership is as frivolous, um, a, a careless of the responsibilities to employees, customers, um, and, and, uh, and the organization as a social organization, as in Britain. So, uh, a part of my chapter is to kind of set that out and actually propose um, you know, what might be um, done. And I think there are some kind of things we could build on. And the Labour government introduced in 2006 a Companies Act, which required um, uh, directors to have a kind of broader view of the company than just immediate shareholder interest, customers, employees, and society beyond. It's never been that. It's never been taken that seriously. And uh, Actually, I co-founded a little think tank called the Purposeful Company, and uh, which tries to make this case that purpose um, should drive profit and purpose should be the organizing kind of uh, culture uh, for a company. Um, and um, uh, under, the under our pressure, both the corporate governance code and stewardship codes uh, now kind of require of um, owners and companies to declare their purpose and to be held account for it. So we are making a little bit of, di little bit of difference that builds on, the se on section 172. And all change um, in Britain tends to be, and change in a lot of Western societies tends to be incremental rather than ruptures. And actually, uh, I think that the, 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 the story of the next 10, 15 years must be to build on section 172, to build on the corporate governance and stewardship code, to build actually on where a lot of kind of asset owners who manage your pension fund uh, and manage your savings, what they want, which they do care about climate change, is to start incorporating this in regulation and law. Um, and I think we should require companies when they, um, uh, when they, when they um, incorporate to actually set out their, their purpose and to be held account for it so that your, your, uh, your, your purpose is to, is to do great things, to kind of push the world forward in some way, to incorporate the, um, the best of the, at the frontiers of technology, to deliver um, great food, um, or to make in Unilever's purpose um, uh, um, sustainability commonplace. Um, and, that should, and then around that, you can start to build a kind of, uh, uh, companies that, are, that uh, build relationships with not only um, in the here and now, um, employees and, and, and customers, but also kind of thinking about their impact in the future uh, and will actually take sustainability and climate change fundamentally seriously. Um, 
I, I think that uh, we could also um, save a lot of money for ourselves by actually requiring all utility companies to incorporate as public benefit companies. That's to say that the, the job of a water company is actually not to make um, a lot of money for shareholders in the most tax efficient way in some tax haven, which is what Thames Water um, did until very, very recently, um, and Yorkshire Water as it was until very, very recently. Um, it is actually, um, to, its purpose must be the promotion of public benefit. Um, cheap and reliable gas, um, uh, water you can drink at the, at the lowest possible price. Whatever the particular utility service is, that should be the public benefit held to account by um, directors who uh, kind of require that to be, it's, um, are, are required by law to do that. And with the government maybe taking a one pound or two pound um, foundational share to insist that happens. So instead of spending 250 or 300 billion pounds or even more on nationalizing um, our, our utilities, we could spend 50 quid and arrive at the same kind of outcome. And actually in many respects a better outcome because you do need, um, I mean, uh, you need to incentivize people. You do need to have efficiency. You do, there are complicated trade-offs and actually um, nationalized industries as they were run in Britain weren't particularly great at this. And actually some of the, some of the ways that publicly purposed companies, like one or two of the water companies are behaving, kind of does point the sign to something different. Lastly, I'll sign off. Um, you can't do any of this without kind of um, getting some um, serious money uh, behind um, uh, uh, our companies and um, taking up stakes in them. I'd like to see a kind of private sector sovereign wealth fund. I'd like to see um, owners really um, taking their voting responsibilities seriously. I think one should ensure that anyone who owns shares actually votes uh, and doesn't actually pass their voting right to a, um, uh, a, a, a proxy um, agency. Um, and we've got a, a huge nine and a half trillion dollar um, investment management industry in Britain um, who don't take their stewardship obligations as seriously as they, as they can. Again, you will, you will look in vain. Uh, and I suspect in the Cambridge Labour Club, you will, I suspect the number of times it's discussed is negligibly. But um, the nine and a half, the, the nine and a half trillion dollar um, asset management industry, right, full of conflicts of interest uh, and kind of uh, some outrageous sometimes behaviours, which um, the, finan the Financial Conduct Authority tries to get to the bottom of, you know, needs serious reform and attention. So um, we need to think about ownership. I mean, I, uh, as part of the panoply of things we need to move forward on. Thank you. Thanks very much, Will, for providing such a great survey of all of the problems and complexities to do with ownership. Now I'd like to pass the floor to our next couple of speakers to speak on industrial strategy. We have Professor Sue Konzelman and Mark Vivag davies Please go ahead. Great, thanks, Nick, and, and please call me Sue. <laughs> um, so good evening, everyone. It's really nice to be here. And um, I'll just let you know that Mark and I are really delighted to be able to participate from our home in Ely. So we are fellow Cambridgeshire residents. Our contribution to the return of the state considers the question of what businesses are actually for. And this is something you may be surprised to know that Keynes also put a great deal of thought into. The 2008 financial crisis brought concern about major, major social disruption. Should businesses be allowed to fail? And the same thing happened when the COVID crisis arrived. So from a societal perspective, it seems pretty clear that businesses are more about, or about much more than just private profit. In similarly turbulent times, Keynes came to a similar conclusion during, during the 1920s and 30s. Any government can expect its fair share of the more usual economic challenges, such as a major recession, problems in the housing market, or perhaps even a financial crisis. A crisis like the current pandemic is thankfully much rarer. But that also means less experience of how to respond. Decisions must still be made quickly and often in the face of incomplete information and varying opinions. We're still a relatively small group of people in a very tiny part of the country, most of whom are professional politicians, typically make the decisions, and often with very strong political influence. Unless, of course, they reach out for help. The urgency of the COVID pandemic did in fact produce new ways of working together. This involved networks extending well beyond centralized policymaking 
which included private businesses acting more in the public interest than producing a profit. Their focus is something we could and should build upon to tackle the major challenges of not only rebalancing the economy, but also addressing inequality and tackling the climate crisis. As well as businesses, universities, and even the armed forces, some of these networks also included government, which is of course the only institution that can change the legal framework. But government on its own cannot reverse engineer a CPAP assisted breathing device, build a prototype, vastly improve its performance, and have it in production within weeks before finally open sourcing the design for global use. However, UK-based Formula One teams working together with universities, health organizations and manufacturers did all that and more in response to a government call for help. The rapid evolution of these task-focused networks, often with a university at their core, helped develop the UK's response to the pandemic. The scramble to import vital supplies, such as personal protective equipment for the NHS, that were suddenly in hot demand but short supply, spurred the search for locally sourced alternatives. Things would need to be done differently and quickly. In response, local government also showed what it could do. In 2019, for example, the Greater Manchester Combined Authority, or GMCA, like many other cities had developed a local industrial strategy designed to find new ways of working with central government and the private sector to address specific local needs. The sudden demand for high quality PPE and Manchester's long tradition of cotton weaving and garment making resulted in local companies like Private White VC, which until then was purely a luxury menswear manufacturer stepping forward to offer their help. However, being a relatively small company, setting up a clean room manufacturing facility and taking on 50 more full-time staff was a big step. But thanks to its local industrial strategy, the GMCA had 600 million pounds available for development projects. From this, a 1.4 million pound loan was made available to support Private White's working capital. 20 million items of PPE later, and with the new full-time jobs still going strong, that loan looks like very good value for money. Cooperation like this demonstrates the value of engaged and properly resourced local government, as well as how influential a proper business bank could be. The lack of such an institution is among the most baffling of UK policy mysteries. Regrettably though, it seems that central government has failed to learn from experiences like this, having now withdrawn support for the local industrial strategy initiative. This is unfortunate and it's likely to consign the leveling up agenda to the same fate as its predecessor, the ill-defined Northern powerhouse. It's also frustrating because government actually does know how to help high performance networks function effectively over the long term and without the burden of an over ambitious title. For over a quarter century, successive UK administrations have supported UK Olympic sport with funding, a few legal changes and one new institution, UK Sport, to provide strategic leadership. UK Sport is an unusual public sector institution. It's run by former world champion athletes with no civil servants in sight. The rest of the Olympic Sport Network consists of sport governing bodies and teams with much of the sport development decision-making being delegated to them. The result? Team GB rose from a world ranking of 36th in 1996 to third by the London Games in 2012. And in Rio 2016, it became the first team ever to improve its performance following a home games. More importantly for industrial policy, Olympic competition has also created a new industrial sector that by 2014 was contributing 30 billion pounds a year to the UK economy. The implications of this are not limited to industry. Other policy areas such as addressing poverty, inequality, and reaching net zero could also benefit from the involvement of more local institutions. For example, policy aimed at the climate crisis already means the end of gas boilers in UK new build houses by 2025. 
but that would make little difference to the 2.8 million homes in England, which have never been connected to mains gas, around 14% of which are also classified as energy poor. You'll be interested to know that some Cambridgeshire villages are already tackling both problems by working together with local government in various ways and without waiting for central government policy. The village of Reach, for example, now has its own community solar farm, which generates enough power to serve 50 homes or roughly half the village. Since it's a community project run through a community benefit society, the village can fund and manage it according to its own needs. In this case, 112 local people bought shares to raise the 345,000 pounds required. The residents of Gamlingay, just a few miles away, took a somewhat different route away from expensive and polluting heating oil. They opted for electricity generated by a modern wind turbine, this time funded through investment in Bitcoin. Both villages worked with local planners to design and implement the new infrastructure. Perhaps the most ambitious scheme so far is at Swaffham Prior, a village of around 300 homes. Heating Swaffham Prior is a partnership between Cambridgeshire County Council and the Swaffham Prior Community Land Trust. It will use ground source heat supported by electrode boilers powered by renewable electricity during times of high demand. A key consideration was that household income should not be a barrier to joining the system. So the project also helps to address fuel poverty. These initiatives in just three villages a few miles apart will sell, save well over 47,000 tons of carbon over their projected lifetimes. So is the government's leveling up policy agenda really investing in anything like the right kind of, of infrastructure? The focus on roads and high-speed rail though appear unlikely to be rethought. Neither is the NHS's privatized global supply chain, which due to the pandemic failed spectacularly enough to be described as knackered by senior arm, army officers. There also appears little interest in encouraging more villages to opt for local renewable energy, probably due to a lack of enthusiasm to intervene in the equally dysfunctional privatized energy industry. Nonetheless, without influential regional and local influences helping to create a more granular approach to policy, debacles like the Northern Powerhouse will continue because leveling up can't be done from the top down or on the cheap. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, a bit of time for some Q&A at the moment. Our first question is actually on the topic of industrial policy. Specifically, um, Didi would like to know your thoughts on the current proposals for developing free trade zones around port communities in England. Uh, do you consider this strategy to be an effective response to the leveling up agenda? I'll turn that over to Mark. <laughs> well, to be fair, we haven't looked into this in a great deal of detail, but I think the immediate response is to look at what they're actually being called. A free trade zone. <clears throat> immediately smacks of a neoliberal idea and would perhaps even be better described as a deregulation zone. So it is very likely that the people who are inside this are going to see relatively little in terms of worthwhile employment and an uplift in terms of their lifestyle. There's also the question of exactly where you put the boundaries of them, or indeed where you put them at all. Because of course, if there is a benefit perceived by organizations that feel they can benefit by relocating to these, it is going to suck business, trade, and quality of life out of areas surrounding them. So there are certainly those two main considerations. I think it's also worth looking at the history of the things like um, investment zones that we've had for many years since about the 1970s. The track record of success of these things is fairly limited. So I'm inclined to think that if you go back to what Sue was just saying about UK sport, 
where most of the decision making has been delegated down to the individual sport governing bodies who of course know most about the sorts of sport that they're operating you would be probably better off not opting for these sorts of free trade zones but rather delegating to other institutions like district and county councils who are able to run local projects like those at Swaffham, Prior, Reach, Gamlingay or in Manchester and dealing with actual real problems rather than trying to create a few more. Certainly not the most sanguine response, but I think one which is certainly justified given what we've heard. Now, if there are no further questions, we'll launch straight into the second half of our presentations. So next, I would like to ask Stuart Landley to discuss inequality and a basic income floor. Sorry. Sorry, I, I, I had to demute, so I had to come out of the slides, but I'll put them back up. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to, I've been asked to talk mainly about uh, inequality, and this is really a talk in two halves. So uh, in the first half, I want to look at the state of inequality in the UK and how it's shifted over time. And in, in the second, Part, I want to look at one possible proposal uh, that would help to reduce the level of inequality through a universal basic income. Uh, so just to have a look at... Uh, some reason they're not moving down um okay so i'll, I'll have to i'll have to, uh, to talk through the through these slides um uh oh hang on let me just try this that's better can you see that okay yep looks good yeah, okay so uh, yeah, I'll just talk about uh, trends in inequality first. This graph uh, shows um, trends in both poverty and inequality since the mid-1970s. Now, uh, the mid-1970s was a historic moment in, in, in British economic history because it was a period of peak equality and a low point uh, for poverty. Now, uh, since uh, the mid-1970s, uh, that pattern has gone, in, gone into reverse. Inequality has jumped significantly uh, and poverty has also jumped as well. So if we look at the level of child poverty, it's actually more than doubled in the last uh, 40, 40 years. So Britain, as a result of these trends, Britain is now uh, has moved from being one of the most equal countries in the rich world uh, to, one of, to the second most unequal country amongst uh, rich nations, not particularly a record to be proud of. Um, now, I, I want to sort of try and illustrate the impact of inequality on relative living standards by comparing uh, the average incomes of the poorest fifth in Britain with the equivalent uh, in, other, in other countries of comparable levels of wealth. So this graph shows, for example, that uh, the, the poorest fifth in Germany are actually a third better off than the on average than the poorest fifth in Britain uh, and similar sorts of figures for Denmark, France and so on. So and the main reason for that is that these other countries are much more equal than Britain and greater equality is associated with uh, lower levels of poverty. Um, Essentially, what we've had over the last um, 40 years is an economic experiment in running the economy at much higher levels of inequality. And it's ordinary people who've been a kind of laboratory uh, to see, to, to look at the impact of this effect. Um, now, all democratic societies 
need to justify their levels of inequality. And the architects of the inequality experiment argued that we needed more inequality because a stiff dose of inequality was necessary uh, to boost economic progress. And the more progress we had, the better off everybody uh, would be. Uh, now, because we've had this 40 year period, we now have a huge body of evidence about the impact of this experiment. And the evidence is very clear that on almost every sort of measure you'd want to use, uh, the strength of the economy, social fragility, uh, voting patterns and climate change, uh, inequality has been bad news. Um, the evidence is very clear that high levels of inequality uh, reduce uh, economic resilience. Uh, they also create much higher levels of poverty. And we know in Britain that there are now more food banks than there are branches of Greg's. If you look at voting patterns, um, the gap uh, between uh, the proportion of wealthy households voting and poor households voting was about even in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, it's now it, there's a 23 percentage point gap. So there is a huge difference. You know, the, the, the poor are effectively, the low income families are effectively opting out of politics. Um, now, I, I now want to switch to the second half um, of the slides. Um, and uh, I really want to look at a particular pro proposal for a universal basic income. Now, I hope you're all reasonably familiar with the concept of UBI. Um, I, I personally call it a basic income floor, which I think is a more accurate uh, definition of what it really is. And what I've been doing some work with, with, with a colleague, um, which actually looks at the impacts of a very modest basic income scheme. This basic income scheme, we would pay every, all children would get £40 a week, not means tested, guaranteed, no questions asked. Adults uh, would get £60 a week. So these are quite modest sums. But for a family of four, that guarantees an income of 10400 a year. Not enough to live on, but an anchor uh, for making uh, choices and deciding uh, what kind of uh, life you want to lead. Now, what, are, what is the impact of such a scheme? Well, we can see that there are very significant gains uh, for the poorest households. Uh, th th this graph shows the gains starting with the lowest ASAR rising up to the highest ASAR. And you can see that um, uh, the poorest uh, tenth in Britain, they double, more than double their incomes as a result of this system. And it's actually paid for uh, by the top two day sales. Uh, and the reason for this is that we've also adjusted the tax system in such a way that you be claw back the gains to the better off. So all the gains are actually concentrated amongst the poorest households. And, and if we want to look at the, uh, the impact on uh, key measures, uh, we can see that child poverty under this scheme would fall by more than a half. In other words, it would actually take us back pretty close to uh, the level of poverty, uh, the low level of poverty that we had in, in the 1970s. Working age adult poverty doesn't fall by uh, quite so much, and that's because we weighted uh, the system in favor of children. Pensioner poverty also falls by more, th by more than a half. And the uh, Gini coefficient, the Gini coefficient is, is a, 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 a summary measure of inequality falls by over a tenth. Um, now, this scheme that, that, that we've devised is fiscally neutral, i.e. it doesn't cost the exchequer anything. Um, the cost of giving out these incomes every week is met uh, by changes in taxation, which are designed to claw back the benefits from the top. So there will be no net increase in taxation for this scheme. So the, the, even um, a very modest system of basic income would have a, a significant impact on some of the social and economic problems that have been created as a result of higher levels of inequality. So, I mean, as you probably know, the, the issue of, of UBI, of a universal basic income, is controversial. It divides opinion. Um, but it, 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 there is a momentum now in Britain behind the idea. There are lots of local groups supporting UBI. And a lot of the criticisms are that it would be 
too expensive, there'd be too many losers, uh, that will be difficult to administer. Well, I think we, we've shown that it's perfectly feasible, it's affordable, and it would be highly progressive. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stuart, for a very pragmatic case for UBI and a nice survey of the state and development of inequality. Uh, next, we will have Professor Montgomery to speak on household debt relief. The floor is yours. All right, thank you, everyone. Um, I do feel bad. Oh, oh, can you see me okay? Am I frozen? One second, my bad. Is it okay? Can you hear me? Um, we can hear you, but I can't see your camera. Hmm. Let me just see if that works. There we go. Yeah, perfect. Okay, it just shut off. It's on strike like many lecturers. It doesn't realize we're supposed to be back at work this today. Um, so yeah, I just uh, want to talk about the chapter uh, in the book, um, The Return of the State, which uh, I really want to recommend to everybody. You know, the what we're talking about uh, here is, is is part of that collaboration, which was, I think, a really excellent attempt to kind of bring together the various proposals um, around restructuring. And, I, and mine dovetails nicely to what um, Stuart was talking about, where this is sort of a fiscal measure uh, and focused on income inequality in particular. The case for household debt relief shifts the register towards debt-based inequality, and I'll explain what that means in a minute, and looking at monetary measures uh, that can be put in place to offer um, relief, debt relief, which is a form, again, of, of, of welfare um, measures uh, to kind of improve the overall case for, um, again, economic well-being uh, in, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, but, but generally since 2008. So let's start then with this idea around, um, you know, restructuring for the, 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 the common good and the idea of the return of the state. Well, in the case of, uh, you know, what's called, been called unconventional monetary policy, we, um, the role of this, the state in intervening um, sort of ex post to deal with financial crisis, um, especially since this period of the 1970s that Stuart, Stuart outlined, has been a, a kind of step-by-step -step progression of increasingly intervening in the wake of financial crisis to give ever larger um, sort of bailouts, monetary measures, stabilizing mechanisms, and, and ultimately um, debt monetization or the use of, of public debt um, uh, to the central bank to kind of through quantitative easing to, to generate uh, liquidity within the financial system. So if we start with that idea that the state has long since returned and continuously intervened uh, in, in the wake of financial crisis, let's now consider what could be done as part of restructuring to create a common good and, and, and the use of debt relief within it. So the story then starts with this idea that we live in a, or we had lived for a long time in a period of low interest rates and, and ever kind of uh, more complex and, 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 and larger in scale monetary uh, measures uh, developed by the state in order to um, create you know, stability in the wake of crisis. So when we wanna understand debt-based inequality, we have to really start here this period of historically low interest rates and look specifically at the terms of credit. So while corporate bor borrowers, banks and other large transnational corporations enjoyed this period of historically low interest rates uh, to a point where the past um, you know, five years there's been negative real rates, this is not the case for the retail borrower or those that live in households. Instead, they, you have to understand debt-based inequality is operating under the terms of credit. If, if banks and, and large financial corporations trade at near zero or negative rates uh, when they're able to, to access debt through the discount window, retail borrowers are those that borrow from these institutions and they do so at ever higher rates of interest. So the cheapest debt uh, a household can get is for a mortgage. The more of the home is owned, uh, the, the, the more competitive the interest rate. Home equity loans, buy to let mortgages are layered on top. Interest rates are charged, uh, debt is charged at a higher rate of interest. Consumer loans, whether they're for cars or, or, or just basically uh, lines of credit, again, will be anywhere between, so if we think mortgages will be anywhere between 
one percent uh, to two and a half, depending on the loan to value ratio. Equity and buy-to-let mortgages, again, depending on the term, will operate somewhere between, again, one and a half to, to three and a half percent. Consumer loans will be anywhere from five percent to, again, credit cards will be 27 to 30 percent interest rates. Again, while the very institutions that are issuing these loans are able to access historically low rates. And then we have uh, fringe financial products like payday loans on top of that. And then the the, the one type of loan product that I believe many uh, students on this call will be familiar with is education loans, which again uh, has a kind of fixed rate of retail price inflation uh, index interest rates, which again are going up higher and higher. So if these are the terms of credit that create inequality, there is precisely where debt relief is targeted. It's targeted at the debt overhang, the, the huge stock of debt that is amassed uh, during this period of, of, of historically low interest rates and seeks to target this stock of debt through refinancing or long-term uh, long refinancing operations um, by the central bank. This is because debt acts as a preemptory claim on in income. What's interesting about what's happening in the present day is that, sorry, what's happening now is that present day income is being bled every month, you know, with each pay packet to, to service past debt. So the interest rate uh, that that debt is charged at is extremely relevant. And it's why the refinancing of, of consumer debts will, is, is meant to cut the costs uh, of servicing debt and give people access to their own um, income. So just to conclude, I, I wanted to put this proposal uh, in the context of the current debates, which are to actually increase interest rates uh, in response to inflation. So here I have outlined an entire case that says, well, we need to give households access to, to cheap credit in order for them to be able to refinance their debts so that the cost they, you know, of servicing them goes down. This works like a tax cut in reverse, or, well, not a tax cut in reverse, but like, a ta like the argument for tax cuts, let's put it that way. The argument for tax cuts is that uh, it gives people access to more of their present day income. Well, so does debt relief. But the proposal today uh, by the Bank of England is actually to put up interest rates, which means that having enjoyed huge amounts of bailouts in the past due to financial security, uh, sorry, financial crisis, these institutions enjoy more security by the promise that they can actually increase interest rates on these debts, which means even more of present day income will go to service past debts. And this is at a huge expense to the debtor. Those that may today be able to manage their debts as interest rates creep up, they won't be able to in the future. This means that the debt stock will continue to, to stifle uh, and squel, uh, squander any opportunity at a, a revival and a recovery. But more importantly, using debt relief uh, as a mechanism actually opens up finance to be more like a public utility, something that works in the, in, uh, the interests of the public rather than an ever smalling, uh, smaller group of institutions. Crucially, it provides a way to link monetary policy to wider welfare uh, provision of the population, rather than allowing you know, forward guidance or, or CPI price measures to be the sole technocratic responsibility of the central bank. Instead, it must use credit as it, and recognize the role that credit plays in society and use its role uh, as the central bank in order to grant relief to those who are suffering most um, uh, under the weight of indebtedness. And I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Professor Montgomery. I think it's so important in this age of financialization to discuss not only public debt, which we always hear about, but the costs of private debt and the different dynamics that that entails. Now for our final uh, final discussion of this evening, I'm very happy to welcome Professor Jan Toprowski to the floor to take a broader macroeconomic perspective to discuss an alternative fiscal strategy for a progressive recovery. Please take it away. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Nick, for, uh, for inviting us, and in particular, inviting us to uh, uh, the home of a kind of one of the most important radical, uh, radical strands in British economics, uh, or at least the origin of uh, one of the most important radical strands in economics. Uh, I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, I, uh, what I want to highlight is 
essentially a differences between uh, the Tory strategy and what one might call a uh, progressive uh, strategy, uh, a progressive fiscal uh, strategy. Uh, uh, Rishi Sunak made clear uh, his strategy in uh, the autumn statement, uh, his autumn statement last October. Uh, he wants uh, to cover uh, current expenditure with current in, uh, uh, with current tax revenue uh, in three years time or two and a half years time now. And a falling uh, debt to GDP ratio uh, that the second probably not not too difficult uh, to achieve in a period when uh, uh, when the economy is recovering from lockdown. Uh, but the ulti his ultimate aim is one that he's put forward and a number of other members of the uh, government have put forward uh, is, uh, 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 is an aim of a low tax, low regulation uh, economy. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, essentially uh, what, they, what they think will be Britain's uh, competitive advantage now that Britain is uh, out of Brexit. It's their version of uh, 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 Thatcherism. Um, in what way would be a, a progressive alternative be different uh, from this? Uh, uh, and I, I argue in the, the final chapter of this book that uh, a, a progressive alternative would, first of all, maintain uh, high levels of uh, uh, government expenditure. Uh, we uh, uh, now, of course, the government says, oh, well, we're going to do this as well. We're going to level up. We're going to build these railways. We're going to build, uh, uh, engage in public works. Um, I, I, I would put to you that actually uh, the, this type of Keynesianism is common to virtually all governments. You find that or governments of all uh, political persuasions from uh, the fascist right uh, through conservatives, liberals to, uh, 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 to the left. And for the conservatives, it's always been an emphasis on public works. And I, uh, in, my, in the final chapter, I argue why public works per se won't do the trick. Um, what a, a progressive alternative would actually uh, uh, spend more money on or maintain government expenditure uh, or, or, or put the increase in expenditure that was forced by COVID uh, uh, as in the COVID re recovery towards increasing real wages by providing free public services uh, and redistributive welfare payments. Uh, this is uh, 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 this, I think, I think is fundamental. It's what distinguishes uh, a progressive recovery from uh, a merely uh, a conservative emergency Keynesianism. Uh, Rishi Sunak's version of this was very obvious in uh, uh, in the plan cobbled together to pay for uh, the, uh, 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 the recovery of the NHS. Uh, in other words, increasing uh, 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 national insurance contribution, uh, charging, uh, 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 making workers pay or making labor pay uh, for uh, services that labor gets. Uh, uh, okay, so that my, my first point is that that uh, high levels of expenditure need to be maintained uh, and to move towards increasing real wages. Obviously, uh, uh, the environment, expenditure on climate change, and so uh, uh, on, on controlling climate change uh, comes into this as well. But uh, uh, it, it, that's the first part of it. Second part of it, second element of a progressive alternative is to make taxes 
uh, uh, more progressive, to raise the tax take as the economy uh, recovers. Uh, 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 Rishi Sunak has already started this uh, with a rise uh, in, in corporation tax. Uh, but actually, I would argue that much more could be raised by raising taxes on capital, in particular to make the tax rate on capital uh, more comparable with the tax rate on, on labour. And why is this important? Well, it's important because a huge amount of evasion, tax evasion that takes place in the economy, takes place through, uh, 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 through people registering as self-employed and effectively having their income taxed as capital income uh, rather than uh, as, as, as labour income. And this is a very simple way uh, 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 around this problem, and that is to raise uh, the marginal rate of taxation on capital to the same level uh, uh, as it is on, uh, 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 on, on labour. Uh, so what I, what I want to argue is actually you don't uh, need to introduce particular new taxes, although it would be uh, very good to have uh, a higher wealth tax uh, uh, and certainly a higher corporation tax is to be welcome. But it actually much more could be obtained by uh, eliminating uh, tax exemptions. The, uh, Britain's tax history is one of introducing uh, uh, taxes on, on, on higher incomes and then almost immediately introducing exemptions affected to uh, 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 allow people to bypass uh, uh, these uh, 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 higher taxes, these, uh, uh, the taxes that they don't like. Um, I should mention uh, in, in this context that free trade zones are a, a, a very uh, common form of uh, a, a tax exemption. It's, it's one that's being, uh, has a huge following at the moment in the Conservative Party. I think Rishi Sunak has also declared uh, his allegiance to this. And the, the, the problem is simply that uh, it, uh, 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 the, the, the kind of, uh, uh, free trade zones uh, simply are another way in which businesses can uh, avoid uh, uh, the uh, 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 taxes. And in, a, in actual fact, it doesn't actually, it doesn't in, uh, actually create uh, uh, many new jobs. I believe at one time the World, uh, the World Bank was uh, 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 actively promoting free trade zones and it went cold on them after a while because they realized that this is uh, it just reduces the tax base uh, for uh, uh, for governments incidentally i'm uh, uh, i'm talking to you uh, tonight from one of the few countries that ever made a success of, uh, uh, of uh, free trade zones uh, and and that is mauritius but the reason why they made a success of it was that they opened their free trade zone uh, just at the time uh, when Hong Kong was being handed, handed over to China uh, uh, well, 25 years ago. And it's now, uh, uh, and they, it, they managed to bring over a lot of uh, uh, Chinese uh, 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 capital to provide employment here. But this is exceptional, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, for the most part, uh, uh, these uh, tax exemptions just provide holes in uh, the, the tax system. There's, there's not even much evidence that they uh, 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 that they that, that they increase uh, that they create jobs, uh, create additional jobs or or, or investment. So uh, my second point is that a progressive alternative has to make taxes more progressive. Uh, my third point is, uh, it, 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 it's very, very simple. 
uh, it, it's just one word, accountability. Uh, what we've seen from the Conservative Party in uh, the last two years uh, uh, under, uh, under Johnson in their, uh, in their conduct of uh, uh, COVID, uh, uh, the organization of COVID supplies is a very, very blatant uh, uh, lack of accountability uh, in, in their, their subsidies for the uh, 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 for the private sector to maintain employment turn out to be riddled uh, with fraud. Uh, if a, a progressive alternative is uh, yes to have government intervention, but to have it democratically accountable. So I'll finish there, and uh, uh, let's get down to. Uh, uh, discussion or any questions if there are any. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Jan. Actually, the first question we have here dovetails quite well with the note that you've uh, that you've just finished on, which is coming from Ivan, and he asks whether the book explicitly tackles the stigmatization of corruption in the state. Is how he puts it. So this idea that if we observe state corruption as we have probably seen very recently in Britain, how can we then make the argument that the state should be more involved in the economy if someone would be inclined to think that would breed the scope for potentially more corruption? Uh, it, it, it could, but uh, you know, corruption takes place uh, in uh, countries where there's no accountability. You know, uh, countries like Putin's Russia. If you have, uh, uh, as, uh, as we have, a, uh, a, a parliament to which ministers can be called uh, and, uh, uh, and questioned. If you have an independent uh, judiciary, uh, as if you have uh, strong trade unions, you can question what companies, uh, 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 which can question uh, what uh, companies are doing, then uh, you have the basis for some kind of social uh, uh, accountability. Uh, you don't have it uh, in a one-party state, and I'm afraid uh, you know, there are elements uh, of, the, of the present government which are uh, very similar to a one-party state. Indeed. I think our next question is one I'd like to address to Professor Montgomery on the question of debt relief. In particular, if we're doing our double entry bookkeeping, one person's debt is another person's asset. So what do you think the particular politi uh, political economy barriers might be to this idea of large scale debt relief that you might see from financial interests? Well, sure. Uh, that's a great question. I mean, I think the one thing that's always important to remember that necessity will will breed the, 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 you know, the very demands, the very hardships caused by indebtedness is the very kind of, you know, is fomenting the, the very need for it. And again, we can see, um, you know, the calls for student debt cancellation uh, in the US growing, you know, it started 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when they would say that, you know, the bubble is getting bigger. And now as more and more people are affected, you can see the legitimation of these calls, the way in which they're increasingly seen as necessary, even if they were, are radical. But to your point about the, the balance sheet and, and one person's debt is, a, is another person's asset. Again, I think, you know, it's really important to, to understand that, like I said, putting up interest rates is, to, to, to give since 2008, really a blank check of, of repeated liquidity injections, repeated to support the financial sector, only to find that after all this time, it's only breeding a huge debt stock to then say, all right, to clamp down our liquidity, put up the interest rates, it's, it's, it's more of a bailout. So in this respect, debt cancellation will exactly target the, the rent seeking and the profiteering off basically state subsidized credit. 
right? You know, the way in which public debt and private debt are very porously uh, connected via the treasury and the central bank. So it will undoubtedly affect the pension funds, the major investors that hold huge stocks of private debt as an asset, right? They're uh, really relying on those anticipated income, uh, you know, payments of people's income month on month, and they will have to take a haircut. And, and the justification, of course, will only be uh, the years of windfall gains, <laughs> you know, being followed by uh, years of austerity. I think we know this argument. We need to tighten our belts at the top since uh, uh, the, the, the profits have been lucrative and free flowing um, since 2008 as it relates to retail uh, debts anyway. But I think, again, the bigger objection, if I'm honest, is not an economic one. Right? Because I think the economic case and the technocratic case for debt relief, as I talk about in my book, is quite straightforward. These are the exact arguments advanced in 2008 around toxic loan write-offs and around uh, long-term refinancing. If it's necessary, it, it can be done. Uh, this time it's only targeted at households instead of uh, corporations. So it can be done. The objection isn't a balance sheet one. The objection is a moral one. And, and the moral objection to debt cancellation is one that runs at the very heart of, of our understanding of who we are in a kind of financialized uh, capitalist system. And that is that, you know, your debts must be repaid. And if not, then, then what does that mean um, to kind of social order? Because what we've understood since austerity and bailouts is that if you can have your debts forgiven and refinanced, that is a real tell of power and where you sit in social hierarchy. If you start allowing that to, to, to be extended to every over indebted person, uh, then that's quite destabilizing. So again, the, the argument against debt cancellation is always a moral one. It's shock and awe of what will happen if we ever forgive debts. Forget all the debts we, we cancel again, like we've seen fraud loans written off, I mean, we've seen ample examples of debt cancellation. The moral objection will be that it will break down social order uh, because people will become hedonistic. You know, they'll, it's moral hazard. They'll just borrow more. Um, probably the most disingenuous is what I call the chicken little argument. You know, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, which is to say, if we cancel these debts, banks will never lend again. I mean, if you can imagine such a absolutely untruthful statement as banks that are organized around an originate and distribute model will all of a sudden not originate loans anymore. I mean, that's to say they will shut up shop altogether. Um, again, uh, do we want in financial institutions that can only lay, lend at such incredibly high rates of interest without any sense of purpose? No, but that is the threat, right? Uh, that is the threat. And I think that those threats, the moral threats, uh, and the threat to kind of future stability are really what will be mobilized uh, against debt cancellation and will only remain convincing as long as they're given a platform by um, powerful policymakers, I think. Certainly, I think it's very important to highlight the degree of not just the economic argument, but the social conventions and perspectives associated with any particular, what's, you know, what might seem like an economic argument and to be completely objective often has subjective qualities. I think that dovetails quite well again into what Sophie's asking, uh, which is particularly in regards to a wealth tax in that the public is historically reluctant to accept a wealth tax because there's a strong belief in meritocracy. Um, so to what degree do you think levels of public understanding about the economy are a barrier to real change? That's a question open to any panelists you'd like to take it? I think that uh, as an answer to that, it's uh, crucial to deal with the inequality justifying, inequality legitimizing ideologies. Um, the idea that the social hierarchy is a reflection of, of um, uh, an innate ability um, that the connection between ability and social status, uh, actually most of the causality goes in the opposite direction to what most people think. Uh, what appear to be innate differences in intelli intelligence are more often uh, differences in, in uh, status and education. Uh, that's very clear. And the whole program on um, uh, 
IQ and uh, intelligence is really a failed research program now. Uh, nobody believes in a gene for intelligence. There are hundreds or thousands of genes for endless different aspects of uh, cognitive um, characteristics. Um, but all the, all the ideology that goes into thinking that we depend on the rich uh, for their initiative, that we depend on inequality to spur ability, uh, there's a nice study, for instance, of um, uh, patents per head of population that shows uh, they are lower, systematically lower in more unequal societies. So it, it, the relationship is exactly the opposite to what people imagine. And we just have to work on exposing these ideologies as a force. And Jan, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, yes, I will just uh, add that the uh, uh, actually the, uh, the, the the main um, corrupt uh, 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 the, mo the most corrupt influence on meritocracy is inherited wealth, uh, and it, 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 just simply because your uh, inherited wealth comes to you because. Uh, uh, from your parents, regardless of uh, your your personal qualities, regardless of your brains, regardless of how how hard uh, you work, uh, there's absolutely no reason why inheritance tax shouldn't be an inheritance tax shouldn't be higher uh, than it is now. There's no reason why, uh, as was recommended uh, by the the. the, the report on, on funding social care, why social care should not be uh, funded by a general uh, uh, tax on inherited wealth, you know, much, much fairer uh, the, 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 than what happens now. As for uh, it discouraging uh, uh, enterprise and, uh, and hard work, well, it would still leave people with the fruits of their hard work uh, you know, to at least to leave people able to enjoy the fruits of their hard work uh, and, and their, uh, their, their enterprise. It would simply mean that uh, people who, uh, their, their children, uh, would have to pay a certain amount for the privilege of inheritance. And Stuart, would you like to wrap us up for that question? Yes, I, I just want to say something about uh, wealth. I mean, uh, I think that um, the level of uh, wealth in the UK is around 15 trillion. The size of the economy is just over 2 trillion. So the level of wealth is seven times the size of the economy, and yet it's barely taxed. So most of our taxation comes from tax on income. Very little comes from tax on wealth. Now, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, and this increase in this level of wealth that's seven times the size of the economy uh, was only three times the size of the economy back in the 1960s. There's been a great surge in the level of wealth relative to the size of the economy. Now, this is not most of this surge is not the result of wealth creation, of creating better infrastructure, better industries. Most of it is unearned i.e. Um, the, the, the key drivers of this increase in wealth, private wealth, have been uh, privatization, uh, asset inflation, uh, inheritance, um, and, and extraction, I mean, it, it kind of forms of extractions carried out by corporations. So most of this wealth is unearned. Uh, so um, yes, there are barriers to introducing a wealth tax, but actually, recent surveys have suggested that it's rising in public po popularity. I think we need a national debate because harnessing this uh, wealth pile would provide huge resources for the social reconstruction of Britain. And we really do need social reconstruction. Uh, but we have to take people with us. We, we, one, we need... Uh, politicians who are prepared to stick their neck out and say that's what we need and then try and carry people with them uh, but we also need we need a social movement for 
um, for um, you know harnessing uh, assets. We need to, to fire on asset redistribution to tackle these problems, as well as firing on uh, income redistribution. So yes, I think what we need is a is a national debate on this issue. Brilliant. That takes us very well into a final question uh, on the note of not only top-down intervention, but bottom-up politics and a national debate, given the reality of regulatory capture. The question posed here is, should we not be talking about the return of the commons just as much as we talk about the return of the state? Does anybody have a reaction to that to end our conversation for this evening? I'm quite happy to, I mean, if you've not had enough from me, I'm quite happy to have a go at that. But if uh, yeah, someone else ahead. wants to. Um, yes, this, 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 this is another uh, important issue that um, uh, we have basically privatised large chunks um, of our social and natural infrastructure that should be held in common. Uh, and uh, so this is the, 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 we have private I mean think just take land um, there have been various attempts over the last hundred years uh, to try and socialize uh, the development value that comes from increases in land prices uh, but we have nothing of that sort now uh, you know some of the big 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 gains are the result of the private ownership of land. Some of the big fortunes at the top uh, come from uh, the unearned income from development uh, and the landowners who own the land. Very little of that gain is going back to citizens. So I think it's, it's, it's all part of this agenda of rethinking the way we run societies, how we share the gains from economic activity. And it, it goes with wealth. What we need is to socialize a much higher proportion of the national wealth. In, in the 1960s, a third of, private, of, of all wealth was commonly owned. Uh, now it's down to less than 10%. We've basically privatized whole chunks of, uh, of resources. So, yes, I think this is another vital question. If we really are to have a progressive agenda, we do have to socialize a much pr higher proportion of the gains from growth. That way, everybody, all citizens have a stake uh, in the economy and, and growth in the economy, rather than just the, the returns applying to a small elite. Certainly. Would anybody else like to have a final word before we wrap up for today? Yeah, can I just add that uh, the, uh, uh, the issue of the commons uh, has been brought uh, very much onto the uh, agenda uh, with climate change and the fact that we can only deal with this on, uh, on an organised uh, level organized uh, as in society as a whole, uh, in other words, through the state uh, rather, rather than uh, um, as individuals. So um, I think the, the return of the state is partly also because of the return of the commons. Brilliant. And Patrick, I saw you might have wanted to say something. If you wanted to respond to that question or provide any final comments to bookend the discussion. Uh, you're just on mute at the moment. I'll just ask you to unmute. Yeah, there I'm unmuted. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I'm delighted to see that you put up a link to where people can uh, get the book, which is excellent. And I think that the Agenda Publishing is still offering a discount as long as you go through their website of about 25%. So that's the way, that's the place to get it, not from uh, Amazon and so on. Uh, and um, we don't underestimate the scale of trying to get across this message, but we are trying to work very practically with political parties of a progressive nature, not just Labour, obviously, but uh, Greens and Lib Dems, because uh, we have to get the politicians to take this on board. And it is part of our 
our mission to explain, we, we don't underestimate the problem of, of the public misunderstanding economics because they've had a, a wall of propaganda over many years telling them a story which isn't really correct. Uh, so that has to be um, changed in whatever way we can. And that, that's certainly something we're addressing. We obviously, we, we can't uh, do that for the entire population, but we can certainly work on policymakers, uh, leading figures in the media, uh, civil servants, advisors to politicians. That, that's the way that we will try to s spread our message. Thank you. Brilliant, and Sue and Mark? Yeah, I just wanted just, this is one thing to mention is that Guy Standing wrote a chapter in the book called the Retur Revive the Commons, which deals exactly with your point, Christos. And I think um, if, if you're interested, um, I can copy his chapter for you or lend you a copy of my book. <laughs> but no, that's a great, that's a great question. I think if Guy were here, he'd have had a, a quite, um, I, I, ordered it, I ordered it already. So oh, did you? <laughs> yes, yes, Christmas. Well done. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> All right, perfect. And again, yes, I have posted the link to the to where you can buy the book in the chat. So do make sure you buy the book if you're associated with a a university or another educational institution. Make sure that your library buys the book as well so you can get to read it and doesn't come out of your own pocket. And yeah, once again, I'd like to thank all of our speakers tonight for such a brilliant and wide ranging discussion. Of course, we couldn't get to everything in the book. So make sure you click on that link and see what else there is. And that not only builds on what we've discussed tonight, but also discusses some other aspects entirely. And with that, I think I'll say good evening to everybody. All the best, keep safe, and hopefully see you next time. Thank you, everybody, for coming and listening. That was great. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.